Um, I'm just going to give a few uh, general remarks about the play and uh, start with the questions of dating. Our best guess is that uh, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet sometime between 1599 and 1602. Uh, and one curious thing about this timing is that it means that Shakespeare likely wrote this play within five years of the death of his only son, who died at the age of 11, whose name just happens to have been Hamnet. Yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, if Shakespeare wrote Hamlet around 1600, as we guess, we don't know quite what to do with a bunch of references to a Hamlet play from the previous decade. Uh, Thomas Nash in 1589, Philip Henslow in 1594, and Thomas Lodge in 1596, they all refer to a play by the name of Hamlet. And it doesn't seem to have been the one that we know as the play. So Shakespeare scholars have started taking, uh, have taken to calling this earlier play, which didn't survive and about which we know very little, the Ur Hamlet, Ur meaning the primordial or the original Hamlet. Some people believe that the Ur Hamlet was an early draft that Shakespeare wrote that he then fleshed out in writing the play that we now know. Others believe that the Ur Hamlet was written by somebody else and that Shakespeare kind of borrowed from them in writing his own play. But whether Shakespeare wrote the Ur Hamlet or not, it's pretty clear that he looked back to it when he was writing his own play. And that's not the only way in which Hamlet looks backwards. Uh, when we talk about Hamlet today, we tend to, to characterize it as a very modern feeling play. But in Shakespeare's day, they talked about it quite differently because it draws on a number of theatrical devices that were outdated even when Shakespeare was using them. So the ghost, the play within the play, the dumb show, the madman, all of these are time-worn theatrical elements. And so while we praise the play for being modern, Shakespeare's contemporaries tended to praise it for being retro or old school. But in a way, this backward orientation is apt because Hamlet's a revenge play, and revenge plays are really old. They go all the way back to ancient Rome where Seneca was cranking them out in the first century AD. And Shakespeare knew Seneca's works and was undoubtedly influenced by them. In fact, we're still influenced by them today. Hollywood loves a good revenge story. And the formula hasn't changed a whole lot from the first century to the 21st century. You start with a wicked villain committing a reprehensible crime against an innocent victim. Then you add in an Avenger who has to use his courage or her, his cunning or his skill to overcome obstacles and inflict uh, the ultimate punishment, right? And you're done. It's not that complicated. Yet Shakespeare kind of makes a mess of it in this play. Revenge tragedies work best when the victim is innocent, but the victim here, old King Hamlet, is no saint. He's got blood on his hands. He killed uh, old Fortinbras in a duel, and he waged war against the Poles for some reason that we don't really know. In fact, when the ghost of old Hamlet appears to his son, he confesses that he's forced to, to burn in hellish fires during the day until such time as the crimes of his life are, are purged away. So instead of giving us an innocent victim, Shakespeare gives us an angry, violent king who probably had it coming. And instead of a remorseless villain, he gives us a murderer who feels pangs of guilt and prays for forgiveness. And then there's our avenger. L let's put it this way, Hamlet is no Liam Neeson. Right? Whereas Liam Neeson has a very particular set of skills, right? <laughs> skills that he has acquired over a long career, right? Hamlet doesn't seem to have many skills at all. He's somewhere in his 30s, best we can guess, and he's still at the university. So Hamlet's uh, having a hard time just picking a major, much less planning his vengeance. <laughs> So instead of watching Hamlet overcome obstacles and exact revenge, what we do is watch him soliloquize and dither and soliloquize some more. And then when Hamlet finally does take action, he ends up killing the wrong person, stabbing Polonius when he means to kill Claudius. So now Hamlet's not the only one who needs to avenge his father's murder. There's also Laertes, Polonius' son. Plus, there's young Fortinbras, whose father was killed by Hamlet's father, and he wants his revenge. So this proliferation of Avengers unsettles the revenge experience. Instead of having a single unified story with a beginning, a middle, and a bloody end, we get three different stories, all of them tangled together. In one story, the primary story, Hamlet's story, mm -hmm. Hamlet is the grieving son who needs to avenge his father. But in the other stories, the stories of Laertes and young Fortinbras, Hamlet's the one on whom vengeance needs to be visited. So Hamlet, in other words, is both the agent and the object of revenge. His dual role is compelling, but it really complicates the revenge experience. Because now we have to take into account not just Hamlet's position, but also the positions of Laertes and young Fortinbras. 
And because the interests of all these various Avengers are at odds with one another, it's hard to imagine an ending that's going to be satisfying for everyone. One thing's for sure, Liam Neeson would not put us in this position. <laughs> But we can't really blame Hamlet for this. After all, Shakespeare's the one who's writing the drama. And this kind of begs the question, how could Shakespeare make such a mess of things? It's not like the revenge formula is complicated. Give us a victim, give us a villain, give us an avenger, boom, we're done. It seems idiot-proof, yet Shakespeare, supposedly this great genius, can't seem to pull it off, at least not in this play. So what's up with that? One take, I suppose, is to say that Shakespeare just had an off day. Right? The play just didn't quite come together the way he wanted it to. Um, and, you know, we've all had days where things don't quite come off. But the problem with this approach is that it's hard to reconcile the sense of this as being a poor play with the almost universal consensus that this is a great play. Right? There's no shortage of people that will claim that this is the greatest play that's ever been written in the English language. But how can this revenge tragedy be so good if it messes up the revenge part? Well, a handful of Shakespeare scholars have suggested that Hamlet is good precisely because it bungles the revenge bits. In their reading, what makes this play so powerful is the way it excites our desires for revenge at the same time that it critiques those very desires. It gives us what we want, the wild justice of revenge, while simultaneously prompting us to see that this might not be the best thing to desire. For these critics, Hamlet's irresolution doesn't come off as a failing or a flaw, but rather as a virtue. Here's a guy who's steeped in a revenge culture, a man who has every reason in the world to yerk his murderous uncle under the ribs, and yet he just can't give himself over. He can't get past these misgivings that keep rising up in his heart. So usually the suspense of a revenge story is whether the Avenger will succeed in killing the villain. But Hamlet offers us an alternative form of suspense, whether Hamlet will succeed in embracing his role as an Avenger, if this sweet prince will succeed in casting aside his moral qualms and making his thoughts bloody. And if we see the play's great struggle as not Hamlet versus Claudius, but Hamlet versus Hamlet, the moments when Hamlet tries to psych himself up become highly revealing. In almost every instance, the attempt seems misguided. So here's an example. A group of players arrive at the castle, and Hamlet asks them to perform a speech about a young man avenging his father's murder. So the player recites in gory detail a brutal revenge killing wherein young Pyrrhus hacks to pieces a feeble old man who can't even hold up his own sword. The player's speech would seem to underscore the, em the emptiness and the cruelty of revenge, yet Hamlet tries to use it as a call to action. Or at another point in the play, Hamlet interviews a soldier who's on his way to fight for a patch of ground that's too small to inter all of the troops that will die in the action. Again, this would seem to emphasize the futility of violence, yet once again, Hamlet tries to use it as fodder for his revenge. So over and over, the impetus of the occasion doesn't push in the direction that Hamlet feels it should go. So he tries to twist or misconstrue things until they line up, sort of, with his revenge project. But it's not a good fit. The edges just don't match up. And all these gaps and jagged seams are enough to make you crazy if you look at them too long. Oh wait, did I just say crazy? That's kind of a touchy word with this play. <laughs> because Hamlet tells us from the very beginning that he's going to put on an antic disposition. He's going to act crazy in order to pursue his revenge. And he re reassures us throughout the play that he's, his crazy act is just that, an act. But we have a hard time believing him. First, Hamlet's feigned madness doesn't seem to benefit him in any way. Supposedly, Hamlet decides to act insane in order to get greater license, to kind of carve out space for action. But it ends up doing the opposite. And think about it. If you had a nephew who started acting crazy, you'd start paying more attention to him, not less, right? This is what Claudius certainly does. He says that madness in great ones must not unwatched go. So Hamlet's feigned madness appears to hinder rather than help him in this regard. Second, Hamlet's antic disposition doesn't seem intentional because it ends up hurting a lot of innocent people. Hamlet plays the madman most when he's around his girlfriend, Ophelia. But why should Hamlet act crazy around Ophelia when she is the most virtuous and trustworthy character in the whole play? And lastly, Hamlet's bucking the trend if he's merely pretending to be mad because Renaissance Avengers are supposed to be crazy. In most revenge tragedies from the period, the strain on the Avenger proves so great that he snaps ranting and raving like a lunatic. 
So to be a proper avenger in Shakespeare's day, you're supposed to be insane, not just playing at it. So this is one more area where Hamlet doesn't quite fit the mold, one more way in which his performance is slightly off. And all of these off-kilter elements, I think, is what distinguishes this revenge tragedy from the others that came before. This one gives us the bloody catastrophe that we expect, but in such a complicated way that we can't go all in. Like Hamlet, we have to struggle if we're to surrender to this revenge project. By the time the bloody finale arrives, we're not so sure this is a good thing after all. And this is the richness of this particular play. It's a revenge tragedy that pushes the revenge genre to its breaking point. It's a play that prompts us to question the very premise of its plot. Can murder be both the problem and the solution? If Hamlet, our unstable hero, teaches us anything, it might be that the line between madness and revenge is quite thin. Perhaps the upshot of all this anticness is that revenge is a kind of insanity itself. Thanks.